Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Again, I echo what Jenny said. My name is Liz Harkins. I'm an assistant professor at William Patterson University in the freezing cold New Jersey today, which I was just complaining about. So um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, especially to our panelists for joining us. It's nice to meet and see so many um, friendly faces on Zoom. Um, so today we're going to talk about navigating dual roles as mothers and professionals. Um, and so I'll ask that our audience members um, feel free to either raise your hand or you can put your questions or comments directly in the chat. Um, I will monitor the chat um, and try to navigate that for our panelists so you don't have to worry about that. Um, we'll also, as far as the panel goes, we'll go in the same order every time just to keep things kind of flowing so you know when to mute or unmute, maybe curb your cat, Ruth, to know when to predict that, or actually the cat will probably predict exactly when to yelp, right, as soon as you unmute. So um, thank you again for joining us, and without further ado, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and share whatever you feel comfortable about your family and your current or past professional goals. As I said, we'll go in the same order, so I'll just take it right from the flyer. We'll go Sarah, Ruth, Sholanda, and then Allison. So um, I'll throw it over to Sarah. Okay, thank you. My name is Sarah Cox. I am the mother of two children, Logan and Kaylee. Logan is now 11. He was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when he was almost four. It was a relatively long process, but it happened. So it has been a while. I was a general education teacher for several years. Um, I also worked in higher education for a while. I did some academic advising and fellowship advising and some other things while I tried to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, after my son's diagnosis, I decided to go back to grad school to pursue a doctorate, um, specifically trying to figure out how to teach mathematics to students with autism, particularly things that we expect students to do in terms of communicating about their mathematical thinking and their reasoning. So that is kind of my research area. And um, I am currently an assistant professor at Eastern Michigan University. All right. My name is Ruth Ayers. Um, you know, my, uh, my, I guess my family role with special education goes all the way back to my sister. I have a younger sister. I'm 51, so that means she's 47. And she has severe intellectual disabilities and is nonverbal. Back when she first went to school in the 70s, they had different terms for all of that that we don't use anymore. Um, so I grew up in a family that we, Rita was just part of our lives. She went to church with us. She, you know, there wasn't things she didn't do. Um, things weren't necessarily always set up for that to be successful, but I grew up with that example of she's part of our family and she does whatever we do. Um, I never thought I would go into education because I, there's a lot of teachers in my family. And so I didn't want to be like other people in my family. So I thought I was going to go a whole different route. Um, then in high school and college, I worked at a camp um, on the weekends and in the summer um, for kids with disabilities and just fell in love with that. Thought I would stay in camping um, programs for my career, but I needed something a little more stable. So I thought, hey, I'll go into education, do that for five years, figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And now like 25 years later, I'm still in special education. So I guess that was, <laughs> that was what I was supposed to do. Um, I have, um, I didn't go back um, to work on my doctorate till I was in my forties. Um, and I am now, um, I worked as a special education teacher in two public school districts in larger school districts in Arkansas. Um, then I worked as a special education consultant at Easter Seals, Arkansas. And um, during that time, um, my family added two children. Um, our oldest is 17 and he doesn't want me to use his name. So I'm gonna try to not do that, but he is 17 and he does have cerebral palsy and um, learning disabilities and a TBI. And then my 14 year old Miranda has autism, intellectual disabilities and is nonverbal. Um, we have a diverse family and that we have two moms in our family. And then um, 
the both moms are Caucasian and we have a multiracial son and then our daughter is African American. Um, I think that's it. I currently um, work at uh, Henderson State University as an assistant professor in the special education program. I'm new to higher ed. This is only my second year. So I, I went into higher ed late in my career. Okay, so I guess I'm next. Um, I'm Shalanda Maldonado. I have five kids. Um, ages 26, 23, almost 17, uh, 13 and 12, sorry, almost <laughs> forgot there. Um, the almost 17 is on the autism spectrum and my son, Alex, who's the youngest, who's 12, is also on the autism spectrum. They're on different ends of the spectrum. So I get uh, two different kind of uh, two flavors in one. Um, I have been in education, I have been a teaching assistant for about three years before um, my youngest three children were born. And I love that. I love doing, it was high school. I love doing high school, working with the kids. I mean, teaching them skills that they never thought that they would get. Um, and then we moved to the South in North Carolina because I'm from New Jersey originally. Yay. Um, <laughs> so we moved here and we uh, settled, got roots here. And um, then we had uh, Alex. And his diagnosis came when he was two, his formal diagnosis came at two. I knew something was different at like a year, year and a half. But um, we got his formal diagnosis at two. And um, I was a stay-at-home mom at that time. We went through a lot of therapies and things like that. And I dove in, dove in head first. I went to teach um, seminars and got like really into it. And one day his um, speech language pathologist just said to me, you know, you're really good at this. You should teach. And I said, I've always wanted to be a teacher. And um, I, I went back, got um, my uh, degree in special education, a uh, bachelor's degree, and I never looked back. I love doing what I do. I started off as a resource and now I'm like self-contained and that's where I live. I live in self-contained. I love self-contained. There is so interesting. There's so much to learn from them. There's so many things that you don't expect, but you know, they're like little bonus things that you get from them. Um, I've been doing that for about three years at Queens Grant Community School in Mint Hill here in North Carolina. Um, it's a great little school. I have a tiny class. I love it. I've only got four kids. It's, and I have time to kind of like do everything and three of them are on the autism spectrum. So I live autism at work, come home and live it some more. Um, I've done this collectively about 10 years and I don't see me going anywhere else. I literally just can't see myself doing anything else. I'm currently trying to decide what to get a master's degree in. Um, I'm just up in the air, but I just know I want to get a, another degree, but um, that's pretty much it for me. Okay. Great, I'm Allison Tant, and I have no professional background in teaching, zero, zilch, nada. I came into this world um, when I gave birth to my son uh, 22 years ago. He has, his name is Jeremy Richard, and he uh, has a condition called Williams Syndrome. It is fairly rare. Um, it, the cognitive profile is not unlike a child with Down Syndrome's cognitive profile, just different strengths and weaknesses. And so, um, so at any rate, so he was... Um, diagnosed at five months of age and we entered into the whole world of early intervention did all of that stuff then we started school my first IEP meeting they stacked the room there were about 20 people in the room and it was who thinks Jeremy should get services mom's hand went up who thinks that he shouldn't everybody else said no so um, I had at that point, um, I have been lobbying the legislature um, here in, in Florida and uh, decided that there was no better client in the world than my own son. And I had stopped working because I wanted, he had had open heart surgery, which is part of the condition. He had had a number of, you know, all of the therapies, what we were doing five therapies, three times a week. There was literally no way to really work really um, for a while. So I stopped working and in that meeting, um, I learned what people put up with and live with a lot 
um, and, and around the country, not just Florida. It was particularly bad in Florida at that time. Um, so then I decided to dig in and get busy uh, looking at laws and rules to change, to make things better for families like my son or people like my son, students like my son. And as a result of that, um, it was just an organic growth in my work. I started an entity called Keys to Exceptional Youth Success. It's a fun, we, it was a group of special needs, moms of special needs kids that would get together and have a fundraiser. And we started putting uh, money behind these students for when they, when they left K-12 so that we could pro basically forge paths for them into the workforce, forge paths ways in for them into um, continued personal growth um, and enrichment. And so over the years, we've, we've raised about $405,000. We've awarded a uh, couple hundred scholarships. We've also, and as more importantly, created as a result of money coming with the student versus saying, please create something and we'll send the student. We said, if we hear we have a student coming with X amount of dollars, how can we educate the students? So through that, um, I was able to get our local community college to create something called the Eagle Connections Program at Tallahassee Community College, which is a college-based program just for students with cognitive disabilities. Um, it, we now, that became a model um, which uh, our governor's uh, budget office studied and is, it was kind of like the think college thing. And that became um, the basis for uh, what's called the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities. And now um, TCC is one of those, um, uh, one of the consortium members. And now my local tech school is doing um, seven distinct job force certificate programs just for kids with developmental disabilities um, and other disabilities. Um, and that is it's called the SOAR program at Lively College. So we did that. And then through the other things that we did through my keys work is um, we uh, started a social a summer institute, which Jenny, that's how I got to meet Dr. Root, and that's that summer program is uh, teaches uh, from ten to two um, every day during the summer a uh, basically life skills, social skills, independent skills, job training skills, how to interview, how to how to you know hygiene, um, how to have making eye contact, how to uh, prepare a resume, etc., um, how to budget, how to be a grown up adult um, with disabilities and um, we now are up to 50 students and Dr. Root has an, a PhD student managing it or directing it this summer who we brought on to be a, a teacher last summer and it's just it was just organic and so and it's based upon my own child's life experience and knowing and seeing what he missed so um then I started working on something called Independence Landing which is a non-profit not for non um it's a housing community for people with cognitive disabilities here in Florida built with affordable housing dollars. So it doesn't have the stroke of $200,000 check and then you get to move in kind of deal like an assisted living, but it does have amenities that will help people with disabilities live successfully. And so um, we'll break ground on that later on this year. But it was through those this experience and learning that like how much I don't know, because what I only thing I really do know is my own son's experience, but working with other parents and seeing their challenges. Um, and in particular with this, uh, the, this, the supported living situation in Florida, there's a dearth of group homes. So the only reliable place these young people, the who age and as they age have to live routinely or in a nursing home when that last parent dies. Housing experts in Florida believe there are 70 to 80,000 Floridians with disabilities living with aging parents with no plan. That's a tsunami that's getting ready to hit us, not just in Florida, but across the country. And there's not enough options. And so um, at any rate, so that, that working with families who can't take a vacation together because one parent has to stay home with the very disabled child and the other one takes the other two on a vacation and then they flip. We just, we really have a real dearth of uh, supports for families like this in our, in Florida. And so um, if it hadn't been for, for that, I might not have ever run for the legislature, but it's primarily because of this and what I've learned just through my momness and not and the way I worry deal with my anxiety is to do something about it 
um, and try and what and learning what I don't know and not being afraid to like completely fall on my face um, has put, now put me in the legislature. And I have a couple of bills being her actually ready for the floor that deal just go directly to the two of this more simple issues um, that can be addressed without costing the state a whole lot of money because um, everybody's crying, you know, COVID, poor mouth, COVID, no budget um, that I'm that, that I'm doing being able to get done because of my life walk and so it's interesting to me to learn um, from you what it's like to be a teacher and a mother of a child with this or children with disabilities and I do have three kids I have um, Jeremy's brother has a twin brother um, who's 22 as well and um, does not have a disability other than the occasional attitude issues and then has got a younger sister who you know, so um, who's 17. So I have 22, 22 and 17 and threading that needle between the needs of all of my kids, as you all well know, um, is really hard. And but whatever, uh, you know, it just is what it is. So I'm look, I'm learning, looking forward to learning from you all what you're doing. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Great. We have a nice array of perspectives, it sounds like. Um, so I am going to ask our panelists to describe a situation where you felt it was difficult to navigate your multiple roles and um, also identify some strategies that either helped you during that situation or perhaps that you developed because of that situation. So I will throw it to Sarah. Okay. Um, so for me, I, I think that the hardest thing that I have had to deal with was, so my son is in a general education classroom the majority of his day. We came from a different state. And when we were in that state, I consistently heard from his general education teachers that they didn't believe in accommodations, that accommodations made the child weak or dependent, um, that he was too smart to need accommodations. The school district tried to um, tell us that he didn't qualify for services at all because um, his IQ was too high without actually running any kind of tests. So for me, it's been this constant battle of things that I was learning in my doctoral program about what we should be doing and things that should be happening either legally or what we know works for kids and what I was actually experiencing as a parent. So I was trying to do the things that I had been learning. These are the things that we should be doing. This is what will help the child. And instead I was <laughs> coming up against things that seemed like that it's not worth the hassle. Like we're asking you to give him a visual schedule and a timer on his desk and maybe a first then chart. Like these are really simple things. Why are we having four IEP meetings to fight about <laughs> whether he deserves these supports or not? Um, so I think for me, that has been the hardest thing is knowing what's possible and then actually experience, experiencing what it's like to not have that happen. Um, gosh, I wish I had strategies that I could tell you that worked really well. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can tell you lots of things that didn't work. Um, I think that, oh goodness. Um, I will say that I have had a really hard time working with general education teachers who, if I go into it thinking that they already come from the perspective of my child belongs there. If I make that assumption, things don't tend to go well. Um, so I try to learn from them what their perspective is so that when we are having that conversation, that I at least have an idea so that, because I got blindsided a couple of times, teachers would say like, you need to adjust your expectations for your child. He has autism, so he's probably not gonna become an independent adult. They would say that. And then 20 seconds later, they would tell me he doesn't need accommodations because his IQ is too high. And it was like, I, I can't keep up with you. <laughs> so if I went into it knowing this is where they're coming from, they, this is their perspective, it made it a little bit easier to talk with them about what, what I thought he needed and how we could get that done. 
Um, I made use of lots and lots of resources. So when they tell you that you can bring people to IEP meetings, bring them. <laughs> the great part about being um, in these dual roles is that I have a lot of really intelligent people, <laughs> particularly those that are not emotionally invested in my child that I can bring with me to these meetings. And they can speak on my behalf because I get very upset when someone is doing something that I find to be unreasonable. <laughs> and so they can advocate on his behalf. Um, I would say those things have been helpful. And then the other thing I would say is find your person. So we had a school and even though I was not super effective in communicating with a couple of the teachers, I had a person that was my son's advocate and they almost were like a mediator. So I could go to them and explain how I was feeling. And then that person and I could talk through, okay, well, how can you approach this other person? Or how can we as a team come together and then make this happen for him? And that was helpful to me because I didn't, it made me feel like I wasn't alone or that it wasn't like an independent thing, that it there was somebody there that was on our side. Mm -hmm. I totally hear you on the take people to the meetings. So, you know, I think the most difficult thing for me is like following the same advice I give other people. Mm. Like all the advice, like when I do consultant work or a parent calls me and they want support or, you know, I give them strategies. It's like, it would be really smart of me to take my own advice. And there's been a lot of times that I have not done that and over the years, I've learned that whatever I advise other parents, I need to do myself. I was, um, you know, this has been a while back now, but there was a, a meeting for my oldest um, back in elementary when he was just in second grade, moving to third grade. And in our state, apparently at that time, I, get, I, I think if I'm remembering right, like that next year was when his test scores were gonna really count. You know, and the district needed his test scores to not affect their their ratings. And so apparently there it had become obvious to me during the conference that they had already talked about changing his LRE and how that would be best for him, but no one had told me that was going to be part of the meeting. And I had not taken my own advice. I did not take anyone to the conference with me. And it took every ounce of um, strength I had to not like completely break down during that meeting. And I basically had to say, I was not aware that this was going to be a topic at this meeting. It was not on the notice. I need the meeting to end and we can reschedule when I can bring someone else with me. And then I got out to my van and I broke down and I cried. I couldn't drive. <laughs> it was not, it was not a pretty sight, but but I learned really quickly that day that I could have handled that better had I had someone with me, not necessarily an advocate, but even a friend or um, my mom or anyone that could just go with me to write notes or to help redirect questions so I could think. Um, I was not prepared at all. Um, you know, I have been, um, the person who led IEP meetings for years before I attended one as a parent. Um, so I felt like I was going to be ready for that. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I felt so alone. Um, I knew what the meeting was going to be like. I felt like I knew what I'd have to, I had my notes ready and everything, but I was not prepared at all for how vulnerable and alone I felt as the parent. And I still do oftentimes at those meetings. Now I have someone with me that I with me because I, I learned that lesson, but um, I, have a, I have a much better understanding. And, and when I'm in a meeting now, I do a better job of listening to parents and making sure they feel heard because I can only imagine that I probably didn't allow enough of that when I led some of the IEP meetings because I didn't know what the parent heart felt like. Um, it's also, I will say the most difficult thing has been, I'm sure no surprise to you all, 
but this this COVID year has has really been bad um, mm -hmm. <laughs> with being the mom of two kids with disabilities at home, learning from home. They're still in the public school, but they're doing the virtual learning and then also being a guardian to my sister. Um, wow. It's been a lot of navigating and trying to figure out how to make things work. And some days I think, oh gosh, this is gonna be okay. And other days I completely cannot handle life. And so I've definitely had to make sure that I keep um, my talk therapy appointments and you know get enough sleep. I don't always follow all this advice either, but um, I, I have learned this last year, never to wonder, never to think that the most difficult has happened. Yeah. I never would have thought that this year, <laughs> uh, you know, I still have some days where we're like, how are we going to make it? Um, in Arkansas, luckily, um, the vaccination is open now to everybody 16 and above. And so um, most of us have already had our vaccinations. Um, I feel fairly certain that my son will be able to go back to school in person, but I'm praying for the vaccination age to go down to at least 15. So my daughter can get it after she turns 15 in June, because it would be good for everybody for them to be back in school in person. <laughs> so. Okay, um, most difficult thing. Um, I'd like to piggyback off both Ruth and Sarah. It's like trying to find a balance between following my own advice and, you know, kind of knowing what to do, knowing who to bring and things like that. Um, I very rarely bring people with me to IEP meetings. Um, I think it's mostly because I was a parent before I was a teacher running IEP meetings. So I kind of know what to expect. And then I, as I became a teacher and I started to, you know, know all the tricks of the trade. So now I feel like I'm fully prepared to go to these meetings when I go in. I know what I'm asking for. I know what I'm looking for. I know what the program should look like. I know what my son should be doing. And my daughter, my daughter's in uh, general education while my son's in self-contained. She actually goes to a performing arts school and she has very few accommodations. But um, even though I have to make sure that her accommodations are followed, she's in high school. A lot of the times that stuff goes by the wayside in high school, let me tell you. So I have to make sure that she advocates for herself, which is the most difficult part for her because socially she's just very introverted. She does not like to speak up. So mom has to be the person in the back saying, speak up. But um, the most difficult thing for me is trying to find balance. Um, just like Ruth, I was a caregiver. I was a caregiver for my mom. She had had uh, multiple strokes and was in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I have my two children with special needs and then I have my other children and my husband, you know? So it's, and then my job and those are, all those children at school are my children. And I'm trying to like balance all those things. You got all these balls in the air and you're just like, some days I'm like, I'm rocking it. Yeah, I got all this, got it all. And then other days I'm like, oh God, no, what is happening? And uh, COVID happened, my mom passed away. Mm. And I've just been like, I'm so sorry, crazy. But I mean, I'm in a good, I'm in a good school. I'm with good admin. I'm full support for everything I do. It's great. I mean, not to sound like a commercial, but it's 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 real. When you're a teacher and you find a place where you're supported and you're valued, it's just it makes a lot of things fall into place. Um, trying to, I was a stay-at-home mom when Alex first got uh, diagnosed, and it was easy doing all these appointments and all that stuff like that. And then when I got my degree, and I was like, well, you know, time to go back to work because he was going to school, and um, I went back to work. Trying to balance that was crazy um they they were used to me being at home so if anything happened with him during the day I would just go get him or I would go there calm him down uh you can't leave school and do that so it was it's very hard trying to figure out like he doesn't sleep very well if he's you know having a hard day and it's just like he's got to push on through now and in the beginning he did not like pushing through he would have meltdowns and I would just get phone calls and then my other kids are you know having a hard time and then it's like my husband's like I don't know what to do and I'm like I can't leave and it's just it's so many things and it just at one point I was just like maybe I should just stop working uh, yeah. <laughs> and then it was just like no no we're gonna you're gonna you're gonna persevere you're gonna fight through this and you're gonna get it and then I ended up landing at the school I'm at currently because the other schools I was at, I was at did not support 
the school I'm at currently, they're all about family, like, oh, take care of your, you know, take care of your business. Oh, wow. You know, it's of right. such a breath of fresh air to have that freedom to care for your family, care for my mom when I had to, care for my son when I needed to. And um, it's still, I mean, I still feel like I'm juggling like a thousand balls and I don't want to drop any, but the piece of advice I would give is sometimes you're going to drop a ball and you're just going to have to learn to live with that. You're like, well, you know, some glass, some balls are glass, some balls are rubber. Make sure you don't drop the glass balls, let that rubber ball bounce, you know, just oops, I'll pick it up again, you know, and keep going. And my family to me are the glass balls. So I keep them in the air. Everything else, other responsibilities are rubber. I'm like, oh, there's always, you know, tomorrow. there's always tomorrow. Right. So that's uh, that's how I deal with that, those hard parts. So um, for me, my I, I've had now, my son's finished the school. I've had now 20 years of IEP meetings and I'll never get over that first one ever as long as I live the way I felt the way I felt ambushed the way I felt um, insignificant in making a decision in my own child's life the way I felt over overridden um, ignored my questions and my concerns ignored um, that is something I don't want any mother or, you know you just that is something I'll never and so to this day you know, I can talk about that moment and just, uh, I can get very emotional about it. I will say that it wasn't until I found, I talked to a, uh, actually a principal of a middle school who ended up running for school uh, super, superintendent here later, but it wasn't until I had an insider or someone teach me what I needed to know that as a parent that helped me. And I agree with, with you, Ruth, about don't go to these meetings alone. I didn't even know what I didn't know in my first IEP meeting. And I will say that when it was, we're not going to do anything for Jeremy kind of thing, I thought, what happens to a mom with a kid way more disabled than mine? What happens to a mom who maybe has a language barrier? What happens to a mom who doesn't have a supportive husband or doesn't ha or has maybe two or three jobs and an IEP meeting is the last thing on her agenda to try to work into her day? All I could think about were people who didn't have um, the ability to really kn know what was happening to them. And I, I thought all I could think about is if I'm feeling ambushed, what must those mothers feel like? And so that has been something that has kind of spurred me into to everything that I've done at really, frankly, ever since then is not wanting anybody else to feel like that. It was really, and, and part, maybe it was my own little ego, you know, my own um, having been, you know, someone who dealt with top people in, in corporate firms across the country and what have you that I thought, well, I can manage this. I, you know, but I will tell you that no matter what your accomplishment is in life or not, but whatever it is, you can be, you know, like some massive, uh, you know, rocket scientist, when it comes to your kids, you turn into like crazy mom that fast. And so, like, you know, you lose your composure, you lose your patience, you lose your, you know, all of it. But I will also say um, in relation to COVID, two things with COVID, one is very personal, another is kind of on this professional front, and Jenny can, can attest to this, so last year, the summer program that I do, we were in our fourth year last year, I had to fight VR to get it done, and then COVID hit, and then we were like, we've got to turn this thing on a dime to be virtual, and just putting the brakes on and turning everything virtual was probably the single most challenging intellectual thing I maybe have ever done. It was, and so my hat is off to teachers who've somehow navigated both those last, that last nine weeks of school last year when schools were closed, as well as dealing with virtual and live, like in Florida, we do both. You go to you, the teachers teaching virtually as well as in the classroom. And I can't imagine the, what, what, our, what we're putting our teaching profession through with that. So um, that, was, that was an intensive, intensive effort last year. Um, but also during COVID on a personal note, my son who turned 22, so, his, so first of all, we were winding down everything that he knew right up until he was 22, he's graduating in May. COVID hit in March. I was thinking this is gonna be like for him, extended spring break time. But it was 
a whammy. The ice, the social isolation for him really put us in a near crisis kind of situation. We, he went several nights where he roamed the house and took apart furniture, doorknobs, drawer pulls. This is a kid with fine motor skill issues, y'all. I mean, this, this, I came downstairs and the house was upside down. And I, and I said to him, what in the world's going on, Jeremy? And he said, I just want everything to give. I, now you've got to put it all back together. And I know that was his way of expressing, his, like put, making it tangible for him. You're going to put everything back together. We went through this night after night for several nights to the point where I finally started sleeping in his room. And he literally got out of, moved every three seconds. I timed it. The kid was restless. He was up. He was down. He was talking. He was moving. It was as, and I, I didn't know how to ma make any of this decipherable to him. He also started leaving our house and going to neighbors' homes without me knowing, and that, that had never happened before. And you know, so I, I, I went into a flip out mode, but I was mostly like, how do I, as a non mental health professional, decipher this? How, how do I take what he's showing me and help understand and then turn it around to help him understand? We, we really went through, we ended up having, uh, we, we ha we're on medication now, but it was, it was, I, I didn't know if this is a new normal, you know, 22, that's oftentimes a new diagnosis can hit for a young man, 21, you know, that age group. I was like, is this, is this a new normal? Or, or what? I, I just, it was, it was a real I wrote about it on Facebook. I put I put everything out there. So uh, so um um so because I just thought you know if I can't pr I, if I'm running for office I have to sh part of it is shedding light on what our families go through. And as it turned out, there were several other families in our area going through something very similar. And then um, APD Agency for Persons with Disabilities asked if they could share it, and I said yeah. So they did, and apparently there were all kinds of things like that going on across our state. So I think we have an obligation to, to help teach each other, you know, and help be there for each other. And so um, I think that, and, and it's all hard, you know, it's just, you know, it's all great too. It's, he's the biggest blessing, just like your kids are, as well as your greatest worry, right? So it just is what it is. You just kind of muddle through each day the way, best way you can. And then you have a glass of wine. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you just do the best you can. And um, I think I imagine for you all are all um, advocates for others uh, walking in similar shoes yourself. So that's kind of what, if you can turn around and extend the hand beside you or behind you to help another come along, I think that's what we have to do. Thank you. We actually have a question from the crowd. So I'll ask Alexandra to unmute and throw it out there. If you want to or answer in order, that's fine. Or perhaps just one or two of you, you can unmute um, as well. Go ahead, Alexandra. Hi, um, thank you guys so much for presenting on this topic. Um, so I have, um, I have two children that have recently received di a diagnosis. And, um, and so I'm a special ed teacher and a special ed faculty at um, U maths and I really struggle and I've been struggling a lot with the balance between my sort of obligation to teach others wanting to share my experiences with my students and other people and then the sort of worry that I have um, that I'm going to disclose my child's experiences um, and sort of violate the, their ability to share their experiences with people themselves and I was wondering if that's something that you all have struggled with and, um, and sort of where you guys have come, um, where you've landed on, on sharing your experiences versus your children's. Can I answer that? Um, because I have two children on two different ends of the spectrum, um, Avery, who's more aware of everything, I tend to ask her mm -hmm. since that, now that she um, is aware. I don't share her things, you know, but Alex, I use him as a, tool all the time, especially when I get a new parent to the classroom and they're afraid and their kids just been, you know, sent to my room. I'm like, hey, look, I have a child just like this. I went through similar things. He was in gen ed for two years, even though I didn't want them to, but I had no, I, I wasn't a teacher yet and they didn't really listen to me. That's a whole nother story, but, um, <laughs> a whole nother story. but um, 
I actually just went, al- went along with them and let him go in there and he, he showed them that they were wrong. So, you know, you just have to be able to like, I can use those kind of anecdotes with them. No problem, Alex doesn't mind. He doesn't care at all as long as he has noodles and pizza, he doesn't care what happens. But with Avery, I have to be more gentle because she may run into these people and she may care. And, you know, she she's very, very self-conscious. So I don't, uh, I asked her if I could talk about her. She, she, she thinks that you don't run in her circle so I can say her name here, so. Well, for me, I mean, my oldest, he pretty much when he was 12, 13, um, he started telling me he wouldn't, he didn't want me to talk about him, you know, and that's why I can't use his name today. And so I know what stories that it's okay to say about, and I have to share them more from my experience rather than saying specific things about him. I mess up sometimes and, you know, he doesn't appreciate that. So um, I try to ask him, I try to be aware of that. Um, I, I shared a lot when he was younger, um, but now I'm doing my best to respect what he, you know, that he doesn't want me to share a lot. Miranda, on the other hand, loves the sound of her name. So the more I say Miranda over and over and over, or put it in a song or put it in sentences, she loves hearing her name and she loves being like getting attention. If I'm talking about other things, she wants me to talk about her. Actually, she's, you probably, you might even hear her in the background because she heard me say her name. And so, um, so I just have the two different experiences also of one child I can share more about and one I have to be really careful. So this is something we still struggle with. Um, We, when our son was very young, we made the choice to try and keep as much private as we possibly could until we felt like he was at a point to contribute to the decision. Um, And then we started to show him different perspectives. So we sat down and did a couple family meetings and watched a couple videos of autism advocates and a couple other videos of people who talked about it in terms of it's a difference and they would prefer to keep it diff- like separate. So we tried to show him some different perspectives. And then he had a very strong opinion that he is very proud of who he is and doesn't mind if we share stuff. And then he is also very vocal. So if there are things about him or something that's happening, he will outright say like, don't tell your students that I don't want them to know that. So that. Is, has been our experience, but that it is definitely something we still struggle with. The famous line at my house is like, if I take a picture, he's like, don't put that on Facebook. Oh yes, child. Yes. <laughs> I get that too. We're more careful with stuff that like could be there permanently or there for a very long time or would connect like others have been saying, that might connect to other people that they know. Great, great question, Alexandra. Thank you. Um, So our next question is describing a situation where you felt having that dual role actually benefited yourself, your family, or others. Um, And again, are there strategies that helped you with that or maybe that you developed because of that? So Sarah, we'll throw it back to you again. I think for me, it gives me credibility sometimes. Um, So, and it allows me to start a conversation wearing both hats. So when I am teaching at the university, people who are going to become special education teachers, I get to play the parent role for a minute and say, especially the master's level students who are currently in the classroom, if they say something about a parent or they make an assumption about the parent's desire to be involved, I get to kind of play devil's advocate and say, what do you, what do you really know? Like there's other things that could be happening in that parent's life. Maybe they are really invested. Maybe they're doing other things and it is a lack of communication or they don't feel welcomed or there, there could be other things happening. Um, and I get to share some of my experiences. And I think that it helps a little bit for some of them understand that there are different perspectives out there and that, um, 
just because they're experiencing something one way doesn't mean that that's how the other people are experiencing it. And I get to do that on the other side too. So when I go visit my general education teacher friends and we sit down and they're complaining about the parents or the kids, I get to say like, Hey, <laughs> you know, I, I get that you're blowing off steam, but at the same time, like we're blaming other people instead of trying to spend our energy on what can we do? Is it something that's in the environment that could be changed instead of saying, you know, it's the parent's fault or the kid just needs more discipline or whatever it is. Like, what can we actually use this time to brainstorm? What are some options? Because I could be that parent. I'm your friend. And there is likely some teacher out there that is complaining about me who I know <laughs> that that has happened <laughs> or they're complaining about my child. And would you want that to happen to me? And all of them can immediately say, well, no, but we like you. And I'm like, okay, well, other people like these people, they're other people's friends. So, you know, it's, again, it's that paying it forward and kindness. And I think that credibility in some sense helps people feel like, you know, um, I don't know, that they respect that both those things are happening. I think probably the, mo the most recent example I have is that um, when I say I was a consultant at Easter Seals, um, so that this makes a little bit more sense, um, in our state, our Easter Seals program has the grant from the State Department of Ed to do the technical assistance for the kids in the public schools that have the more complex um, intensive instructional needs. And so it wasn't like I was a private consultant. I worked through the Easter Seals program. And so we were the grant program for the state to make sure there was training, um, personal visits to the school. We were the resource where we'd go out to schools across the state to help them specifically look at kids specific needs and how they could best meet those instructional needs of the kids. So, um, so I've been in a lot of Arkansas schools and um, I'm on some committees through the State Department for that. And I think that when the committee started, when everything went virtual and they were looking at guidance for school districts for what virtual instruction would look like for kids with more complex needs like Miranda, who, you know, doesn't use a computer, is nonverbal, um, you know, developmentally is um, a toddler, but chronologically is 14. And, you know, having the independence and the angst that comes with teenagerness and all that's combined together. Um, I was on that committee and I realized really quickly that the hat that I had to wear in that committee was the parent hat because some of the things that they were going to expect families to do during this virtual instruction was completely not going to work. Um, and so I was able to share specific information about how that might look at our house and how that could work or not work. And I feel like that that made a huge difference for some of the flexibility that some other families have. Um, and I knew that if some of those expectations um, were being thought that families could do and our family couldn't even pull it off, then I couldn't even imagine how some families without some of the resources and educational background would be able to make that work at their homes. Um, for their kids who were at home learning. So I feel like that's the most recent example is just that I was able to use that parent hat in that committee for people to really listen and understand and realize more flexibility had to be built into those expectations for this virtual learning year. I want to piggyback off Ruth again that the flexibility for the virtual learning is super important as for me with my own kids. Um, I have another child who has some uh, learning disabilities and her learning from home. My gosh, I just, I was like, you're going to send me to an early grave and, and then do it for Alex. It was just, it was just very bad. And then I had to go and teach from school and my husband was left here alone to do his job 
yeah. also make sure our children are doing their jobs. Yeah. So that was that's very difficult. So I kind of advocate on the side of my parents, like, hey, you know, if this kid didn't show up to morning meeting, I mean, sometimes, you know, parents got to pick and choose, like, and we're, I mean, our school's rules are pretty, I mean, pretty parent oriented, parent centered. Whereas like, if they come to at least one or two things they can be counted as present, because I mean, it's, it's very difficult in this new Corona age to educate a child and to educate a child at home and going back and forth between school and home. And if you know anything about autism, you know, change is not their friend. They don't love it. So my son going from going to school every day, then coming home and doing this. And then, oh, there was somebody who got tested positive. So, oh no, you're back home, Alex. And he's just like, I'm through with all of this. So trying to keep him together and on stuff like that, that kind of is, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I've been trying to um, make sure that I'm, I've gone through a lot of programs. I've been to a lot of meetings. I've been to a lot of trainings. So I try to make sure that my parents are educated. Um, they know programs available in our area. They know, you know, what they're, uh, what's available to them legally, where, where they can go. Because a lot of parents don't even know where to go for early intervention. Correct. Don't even know where to go. Right. So I have literally a, a binder that I have at my desk. So if I have a meeting, like any kind of meeting with a parent, I can pull that bad boy out and just flick, flick, flick. Oh, you need Easter seals. Oh, here's their number. Oh, you need a uh, Carlton Watkins Center. This is the number you call if you want to get something. Oh, and this is Teach and you ask for Ruth. And I mean, I have all that set out. So if I have a parent who has any questions about anything, I make sure I make that kind of information available because it's it's not like widely known to parents. It's really not. Yeah. And, and it's a shame. Me as a parent, I mean, there's still some things I don't know. Right. I have to, you know, use my professional connections to kind of like find out like, hey, how can I do this for my son or my daughter? How can I get this, you know, how, oh, and then I'm writing it down. Like, I'm going to put this in the book because, you know, some other mom or dad might need this. And it's just mm -hmm. the hoops you have to jump through as a parent with a child with special needs. It's, it's just draining. And then it's like, you have to have your regular life on top of that. It's just right. So I try to be that person who can alleviate that, to take that away from them as much as I possibly can. That's how I use my duality. That's the subject of two of my bills, by the way, in the legislature is exactly that. Cause parents just, we don't know where to start. And that, so that's why I and they're both ready for the house floor. So that's why I got to get it done. So and I got in a great place in the Senate too. So uh, that the, not half of the anxiety is not knowing what you don't know and knowing that you don't know what you don't know. So um, for me, that, that was- I amazing. totally agree with that, totally. So we have about five minutes left and we have one more question from the crowd. So, which um, I think we can squeeze in if our panelists are okay with it. So Tal, I'll throw it to you. Sure, thanks. So I'm Tal and I'm an uh, associate professor at California State University in Chico in special education. And I really first wanna um, thank you for sharing all your stories because um, I wanna acknowledge that I am uh, a man in the field. So okay. things come across differently for me and also to me in the field and uh, working with schools, um, but also have my own my own voice and my own stories as a husband and a parent for those with disabilities. Um, but from your perspective, what would you you know what advice would you want to give um, for people that want to become teachers or in the credential programs from for both general ed and special education and what would you like me to pass on to those, my students? I'm gonna start with that because I'm gonna say it from my perspective. And that is that you're literally changing people's lives. The trajectory of my son's life was changed completely by his education and particularly in his transition years of education. And I also think it's fundamentally important to have male teachers because so many of our students with disabilities are male. Um, the that, you know, and so there's, so I think that that is something that is badly needed in the profession. But so, and that's the full limit of what I can tell you. So I'm gonna let everybody else take the real time. So. <laughs> So I would tell them to um, make sure that they have lots of patience and an open mind, because like we've all been saying, 
you don't know what's happening. I have a sign on my one of my drawers at school that says, be kind. You don't know what's going on with someone else. You, you never know what someone is facing. You never know what someone is dealing with. So always remember to just kind of like treat it like, treat it like you would treat your mom. You know, how do you want someone to treat your mom? Do you want someone to love your mom and be sweet to your mom, right? So kind of do that, you know? Totally um, adding to that, I would say um, to ask your students to do their best not to judge the families. Um, I think more than any other, I could be wrong, but I feel like the parents of kids with special needs get judged. Yeah. I feel like I have been judged for different decisions or things that I've done or not done, even though I did what my mom instinct said was best. And for the most part, it's worked out. And I'm glad I made those decisions. Um, but I do think often school teachers or the teachers and the school staff um, approach things in a way where the family might not feel heard or respected for various reasons. And so I think that if those up and coming teachers remember that they need to look at each of those families and students and treat the students like they would want their own kids to be treated and respected and and work together in collaboration as a team. And I think that's really important. But I have been surprised at how many times I have felt judged as a parent um, that I don't think I would get the same judgment if my kids didn't have disabilities. Hmm. I don't know the difference because both my kids have disabilities. I don't have a child without a disability. So I can't compare those two. Yeah, I think everything that everybody has said is very important. The only thing I would add is understand the why. Like as they are learning from you about what makes a good teacher, understand why your instructors are telling you to do that so that when you go out into the field, you can have passion behind it and knowledge and you can stick to your gumptions. And even if other people are not doing it, you know why, you know why it's important. You continue to do it and you can educate others. Great, thank you. Um, so we're out of time and I think this happens every time Megan and Jenny can back me up. We always run out of time and the conversation is always really rich. Um, so I appreciate all of you coming. Uh, special appreciation for our four panelists for taking the time to share their stories this afternoon. Um, our I just want to do a plug for our next webinar and I wrote it down so I would get it right. Um, it's on May 7th and we will be focusing on um, black and brown families and their needs as they navigate special education. So um, please join us on the 7th and um, we will um, hopefully see you all then and thank you again for coming.